Our last little mini lecture introduced the, us to the idea of diurnal motion. That's the daily motion. As the, as the Earth rotates, the sky changes. But the sky also changes with uh, the, the season. So during part of the year, you go out, you look, you look up at night, and you see some stars. If you wait a few months, though, then you look up at exactly the same time of night and you see star, other stars, stars that would have been up hours later in the earlier months. And that's because Earth has moved. So as Earth goes around the sun, the entire sky shifts a little bit. And so, so every day it shifts by a little bit. Well, uh, uh, that means that the rising and setting of the stars shifts by a little bit. Well, by how much? Well, it takes 365 days to go all the way around. Okay, uh, there's 360 degrees in a complete circle. So that means it goes almost one degree per day. Well, it takes Earth by an hour to rotate uh, well, it takes 24 hours to rotate 360 degrees. So 20, uh, 360 divided by 24 means it goes 15 degrees in one hour. An hour is 60 minutes, so that means it takes Earth about one, about four minutes to rotate one degree. And so that means that uh, every four minutes you go one degree. So if it's about a degree a day, that means it's about four minutes a day. So the stars all rise about four minutes earlier every day and they all set four minutes earlier every day. And so that means a star that's rising at, at 10 p.m. tonight is going to rise at 9.56 tomorrow night, 9.52 the next night. After a week, it's 28 minutes earlier. That's almost half an hour. Uh, uh, after two weeks, it's 56 minutes earlier, almost an hour. So if it's rising about 10 p.m. tonight, it's going to be rising close to 9 p.m. in about a week, just after 9 p.m. And then in another week, it'd be about 8 p.m. Well, I mean, in the summertime, that's before sunset. That means it's rising before sunset. Uh, uh, likewise, in the morning skies, you'll see some stars that are rising. And as they rise early in the morning, uh, they might rise a little bit after sunrise. We can't see them because the sun's already up. But every day, they rise four minutes earlier until eventually they're rising at the sunrise, then four minutes before sunrise, and eight minutes before sunrise, and so forth, and you eventually start seeing them in twilight. And so the whole sky shifts about four minutes a day. So that means every night is a tiny bit different than the night before. Well, it's not just at night. It, it turns out that the sun's up, and so, uh, uh, so if, if you have the Earth here, then you see stars at night. Well, there's actually the, the, the stars all around the sky, so there are stars up in the daytime. It's just the sun's in the way. If you had a giant dimmer switch, you can dim the sun. Now, in Texas, in the summertime, that'd be a wonderful thing to do. But you could dim the sun, and it looks like it's sitting in front of a constellation. A few months later, Earth has moved, so you see different stars at night, but the sun would look like it's sitting in front of a different constellation. And then likewise, a few months later, you see even different stars at night, but the sun has shifted into a an yet different constellation. And so you could map the path of the sun, the apparent path of the sun to the sky. Now, really, it's Earth that's doing the moving, but you can map this apparent path of the sun to the sky, and we call that the ecliptic. So the ecliptic is this apparent path the sun takes to the sky. And so over the course of the year, it goes through about 12 or 13 constellations, and we call those constellations the zodiac. And I'll explain why I say 12 or 13 uh, coming up here in a little bit. Okay, so um, so the zodiac, the zodiacal constellations, you know, Leo, Cancer, Gemini, Taurus, Aries, Pisces, etc. These, these, these are going to be the, the constellations the sun appears to pass through. Uh, they're marked on your star chart that you, the lab that you're doing, uh, uh, the, the little dashed line that runs across all the maps that marks the ecliptic. And the zodiacal constellations are the constellations it passes through. All right, so this is actually important for other reasons besides that's where the sun is, uh, because it turns out that, uh, that the Earth and the, the, all the planets 
orbit and kind of a plane, so you see planets along here too. You also find the moon also follows close to the ecliptic also, so, so along in here is where you see a lot of the solar system objects, uh, the same constellations. If you were to map that onto a map of the sky, so here we have like a mercator projection of the sky, and so down here, you know, it says, you know, you know, different time of the year, where do you find the sun? And it makes this arc across the sky. So sometimes the sun to the northern part of the sky, that's going to be in June and July. Sometimes it's very far south, that's January and December. And so, so it, the, the constellations of the ecliptic or are, 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 are along the ecliptic do this. The farthest north the sun ever gets is 23 and a half degrees. The farthest south the sun gets is minus 23 and a half degrees. Now stop and think. I said that we're about 32 or 33 degrees north in Tarrant County. So that means straight up is 32 or 33 degrees north declination. How often is the sun ever there? And the answer is never. Sun never gets north of 23 and a half degrees. Well, normally what I do is I ask the class, how many of you were told when you were a kid at noon the sun straight overhead? And almost everybody says, yeah, when they were in elementary school, they were told noon's with the sun straight overhead. No, it's not. At noon, the sun's supposed to be highest in the sky, but it's not straight overhead. And that's because we don't live between 23 and a half degrees north and 23 and a half degrees south. Okay. If you were to put this on the on the celestial sphere, it would look like this. There's the, the, the ecliptic, so there's the equator in the middle, so there's the celestial equator, so the sun's sometimes in the northern part of the sky, sometimes in the southern part of the sky. Well, that's actually very important because when the sun's in the northern part of the sky, it shines more intently on the northern hemisphere. Uh, in fact, uh, because it's more intently on the northern hemisphere, it rises early and sets south. Uh, remember, you're closer to where this straight overhead is right up here. North, solar celestial pole is right over the Earth's North Pole, so we're right here. Straight up is right there, so it actually rises uh, uh, here in the northeast and sets in the northwest and it's up in the sky for more than 12 hours a day and below the horizon 12 hours a day. Well, in the winter time, it is below the horizon for more than 12 hours a day because it shines more intently on the southern hemisphere. And so, so this gives rise to the seasons. Okay. The farthest north it ever gets, that's going to be the longest day, that's the summer solstice. The farthest south it ever gets is the winter solstice. When it's on the equator, then basically it covers exactly half of the earth. And so we call that the equinox. In theory, it's supposed to be equal day and equal night. It's not quite that simple, but because the Earth's atmosphere, but, but that's, that's the idea. Okay. Now, as I said, the problem is it's never directly overhead for us. Well, why not? Well, because it never gets high enough in the sky to be visible directly overhead here. It has to get to 32 or 33 degrees to be directly overhead in Tarrant County. Uh, but... It's not the sun that's moving. It's Earth going around the sun. And that's because Earth is in this tilted orbit as it goes around the sun. So the orbit is tilted. So the North Pole points off in a certain direction in space and always points in, it's like a gyroscope, so always points in the same direction. So when the sun, when the Earth is over here, the sun looks like it's more overhead uh, a little bit north of the equator, so the sun looks like it's in the northern part of the sky, and so the northern hemisphere gets more sunlight, and so that makes it warm in the north, and the southern hemisphere gets less than half the day lit, and so it's cooler. About six months later, over here, then what happens is that the reverse is true. The northern hemisphere gets less sunlight, and so it's cooler. That's wintertime. The southern hemisphere gets more sunlight, so that is summertime. So right now, we are over here, so we're going into summertime for the northern hemisphere, but the southern hemisphere is going into wintertime right now. 
Okay, so come December and January, uh, we're going to be in this kind of configuration over on the right over here. And so what will happen is in the northern uh, uh, part, northern hemisphere is going to be winter time, and the southern hemisphere is going to be summertime. So what does that mean? Well, it means that in Australia, New Zealand, Santa Claus wears a red bathing suit rather than a, a red parka. Okay, so, but what's the farthest north we can ever be and have the sun directly overhead? Well, because the tilt of the Earth is 32 and a half, uh, or tw rather 23 and a half degrees, the farthest north you can ever be is 23 and a half degrees north. We call that the Tropic of Cancer. The farthest south you can ever be is 23 and a half degrees south, and we call that the Tropic of Capricorn. And so, if you're between the tropics, the sun can be overhead. Now, the question, what about the equator? Well, at the equator, the sun is overhead twice a year, the two days that it's over the, the celestial, it's on the celestial equator, the equinoxes. During half the year, it's north of overhead. During the half the year, it passes south of overhead. Now, what about Mexico City? Mexico City is about 17 degrees north latitude. So, what does that mean? Well, that's less than 23 and a half degrees, so that means that two days out of the year, the sun will actually be passing directly overhead in the middle of the day in Mexico City. For a few, uh, uh, for, for a month or so there, it's passing north of overhead at, at, at midday. And for the rest of the year, it passes south of overhead. And so, but because that's because Mexico City is between the tropics. In the time of the year when the sun is north of the equator, that means it rises north of due east, and so it spins more than half the sky up. In the, su in the summer and the winter time, then the sun is south of the celestial equator, and so it spins more time below the horizon and less time above the horizon. Okay, so the sun rises due east and sets due west only at the equinoxes. And then this time of year, the sun is rising in the northeast, getting close to overhead, but not quite, and then setting in the northwest. So you, get, you can actually get, get, get sunlight onto the northern side of the building. In the wintertime, the sun rises in the southeast, it doesn't actually get very high in the sky. Remember, straight up for us is about 32 degrees. So the celestial equator is 32 degrees down here. And so the sun is about 23 and a half degrees further down than that. So that means that this is less than 45 degrees. So the sun rises, it's only like 30 something degrees above the horizon. So it's really not very high in the sky at noon in December and January. And then it sets not in the west, but in the southwest. And so, so this, this is this annual motion that occurs uh, uh, right there. Well, we also know that Earth's orbit is elliptical. And that also affects things. Okay. So during part of the year, Earth is closer to the sun. During part of the year, it's farther from the sun. The closest to the sun we call perihelion. And the farthest from the sun we call aphelion. So the question is, when are we closer to the sun? I usually ask students this in class. Everybody thinks in the summertime. Well, 2017, perihelion actually occurred January 4th. Aphelion, July 3rd. You know, likewise, January, perihelion, aphelion uh, uh, in July, uh, perihelion in January, aphelion in July. And even this year, perihelion is in January, aphelion is in July. We're actually closest to the sun in July, or rather, we're sorry, we're closest to the sun in January, we're farthest from the sun in July, and this, the reason that it's hot this time of the year is not that we're close to the sun, because we're actually farthest, but because we're tilted, so the sun hits us more directly, and the sun hits us less directly at perihelion. So, uh, so I'll, I'll go ahead and pause this, and we'll start with the next lecture afterwards.